everybody. Welcome to our prayer meeting broadcast once again. And tonight I'm excited to uh, let you know that we're starting a new series, The Church Upon the Rock, a study based on the book of First Peter, uh, a letter that uh, was written uh, in the first century. And uh, hopefully we will enjoy it. Uh, it's a short letter, but a powerful, powerful letter. Uh, I would like to share my personal information with you, my email, pralarcon777 at yahoo.com. Also, my cell phone number, Eric code 978-914-1434. So you can uh, contact me and, and perhaps give me your prayer requests and things like that. Uh, I would like to start praying tonight for Sherry Dickens, and uh, a member of our Qualinga Church who been, uh, has been in the hospital since uh, December, and uh, we pray for her. She's getting better, but uh, still need to pray for her. Also for Elena, uh, who is back in Mexico, and she's uh, struggling with her health, and we ask that the Lord will provide for her. Also pray for the Arnold family, for Joyce and her grandson Cash and their extended family, for the Rogers family, Julie and her extended family, for the Rubino family, Jay and Gail and their extended family, for the Reed family, Carolyn and her son Theron and their extended family, and also for the Wiggins family, Jerry and Janine and their extended family. So at this time, I, mean, I invite you to uh, bow our heads and, and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, and I would like to, at this moment, uh, pray, uplift before you the Arnold family, you know, Joyce and Cash, and uh, we miss them, and we ask, O oh Lord, that the Holy Spirit may continue to bless them in their lives and in a mighty way. Bless Julie Rogers as well and her family. Also bless the uh, uh, Rubino family, Jay and Gail, and the um, uh, Reed family, uh, Carolyn and Theron, and the Wiggins family, Janine and uh, her husband. So we ask that uh, the Holy Spirit may bless all of those families. Also bless the... Uh, uh, lady from Mexico, Elena, and uh, also, uh, you know, the prayer request that we may have in our hearts as well that we haven't uh, forgotten. So we pray for also Jean Huang, for Dorinda Blank, for uh, Rinku, for Melissa Arsadan, and for others that may be struggling, for Jean maybe. Uh, bless our church tonight as we open a new series. We ask that uh, the Holy Spirit may bless us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you once again for being here uh, today. Next week, we're going to be studying in this series, the second chapter of First Peter. I have entitled it, The Church Leaving Stones, next week. Uh, and as you can see in the picture, not far away from here in California, uh, this, the living stones. Uh, tonight, uh, uh, the, the, the sermon is entitled, the study is entitled, God's Blessings for the Church. Uh, it's a study based on First Peter chapter 1. Now, let me begin by saying that uh, the, the context of 1 Peter will be from Matthew 16. And Matthew 16 began with a demand of a sign from heaven. Jesus said, you cannot interpret the signs of, of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for miraculous signs, but none, of them, uh, of, none will be given except the sign of Jonah. And then secondly, Jesus warns them uh, uh, you know, about wrong teachings that would affect what it will be the church. Uh, he said, be careful, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then uh, finally in Matthew 16, Jesus moves in with all intent and purpose to introduce a concept for the ages, a concept that uh, is our, you know, base of study tonight. Uh, he begins by inquiring from them, from his disciples, about the opinions of others of Jesus. They, he asked, uh, who do people say the Son of Man is, right, in Matthew 16, verse 13. Then he inquires from them, but what about you? What do you say? Who do you say I am, he says. After listening for their opinions, Jesus goes on, inspired by what Peter replied to that question, uh, that you are the Son of the living God, you're Christ, the Son of the living God. He goes on to describe himself, and this is what we're going to be studying in Matthew 16, he said, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, son, uh, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my, by my Father in heaven, eight, verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, which uh, in the Greek terms is Petros, and on this rock, and he's pointing to himself, he used the Greek term Petra, 
I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will lose in heaven. Matthew 16, 17 through 19. A few important items are found on the previous passage that we just read, uh, like Peter was Petros, right? The stone, a stone is smaller than a rock, and Jesus is the Petra, the rock, which is larger. Uh, also, the keys here of heaven were not given to one man. Actually, uh, it was given to a man who was representing a large group, a whole group. Uh, in this case, the church. Now, the church is the ecclesia, is the Greek term. Mean, it means uh, the called out ones uh, out of the world called to be a collective group, a collective entity. All of this being said, now we have a general background to start discussing 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, 1 Peter, the whole book, was written approximately between 62 AD and 64 uh, by Peter, of course, and Peter's purpose was to offer encouragement to the suffering Christians, in other words, to the persecuted church. By this time, Christians were being driven out of Jerusalem and forced to scatter throughout Asia Minor. So, uh, you know, the church is the ecclesia, the called out ones who were called out. And now as they're called out and formed this group, they're being persecuted by the world. Now, Peter was writing from Rome where things were probably even worse for Christians there. In Rome, greater persecution by Emperor Nero was just starting. And uh, as a matter of fact, eventually Peter would die executed during this persecution by Nero. Throughout the Roman Empire, Christians were being tortured and killed for their faith. And the church in Jerusalem was being scattered, so the Christians were just fleeing out of Jerusalem as well. The key verse in this uh, book is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. They have come so that you, uh, your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is the main um, uh, text in this passage, in this book. In writing 1 Peter, Peter was using several images that were very similar, uh, that were very special to him because Jesus had shared them uh, uh, to him as he was revealing the truth about him uh, to Peter. Peter's conception of the church, uh, it was a spiritual house composed of living stones built upon Christ who was the rock as the foundation. Uh, you know, and this idea, this concept had come to Peter through Christ himself. Jesus had en encouraged Peter to care for the church as a shepherd tending the flock. So therefore, you see all of this uh, uh, concepts and dynamics are coming to form what the concept of church will be in Peter's heart. Now, this is the reason why we see Peter using living stones uh, in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to see that next week. Shepherds and sheep in, in also in chapter 2 uh, to describe what the church is. Uh, so the church, the basic uh, uh, definition of church, according to Peter, uh, the church is a spiritual house built upon the rock. Now, with all this being said, let us dig in. And I, I begin by saying that the languages, these following terms are found in this book, crushed, overwhelmed, devastated, torn. And they often describe the status of Christians here in First Peter. And in general, they're describing suffering. Suffering has many forms, uh, in, you know, in, even in our days today. Physical abuse, debilitating disease, social ostracism, persecution. The pain and anguish tempts a person and turn uh, to turn back, to surrender, and to give in. So suffering is very dangerous, a very dangerous uh, concept when we have a church, a, a group trying to stay together. So suffering comes in and, and creates division as well and havoc. Now, many first century followers of Christ were suffering and being abused and persecuted for believing in and obeying in Jesus. Uh, beginning in Jerusalem at the hands of their Jewish brothers themselves. Uh, the persecution spread to the rest of the world. Now, this persecution climaxed uh, when Rome determined to rid uh, the empire of the Christ ones, those who would not bow to Caesar. Now, uh, Peter knew persecution firsthand. You know, he was beaten, he was jailed, he had been threatened often, so he knew he was part of this persecuted church. 
uh, he had been, uh, he had seen fellow Christians died and also the church scattered. So, uh, but, but one thing that Peter knew was that he knew Christ and nothing could shake his confidence in his risen Lord. So Peter wrote to the church scattered and suffering for, for their faith, giving them comfort and hope and arguing continued loyalty to Christ as a key to remain faithful. So let us start reading uh, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. One, per, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Verse 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now Peter begins by thanking God for salvation, knowing perfectly well that Christians were under cruel persecution and likely facing trials under Emperor Nero. Peter's letter comes as a refreshing rain in the desert. Christians were not hunted down and killed throughout the Roman Empire. However, uh, this was happening to them, and that was that social and economic persecution, uh, you know, would come to the Christians through three main sources, through the Romans, through the Jews, who were also giving away the fact that, you know, they wanted to separate from the Christians or at, at least be distinguished as a separate entity, and also for their own families of the Christians. Christians were misunderstood, harassed, and tortured and put to death, and something needed to happen. The legal status of Christians in the Roman Empire was unclear at this moment. Many Romans still thought that, you know, of Christians as, as members of the Jewish sect, and because the Jewish religion was legal, they considered Christianity legal as well. However, things would change for the worst. Now, soon Christians became the target of persecution when they refused to do the following. Number one, to worship the emperor as God. Secondly, they refused to worship at pagan temples. And thirdly, they were forced to expose and reject the horrible immorality that was happening in pagan culture. Thus, the Jews began to disappreciate being legally associated with Christians. So they didn't appreciate the fact that, you know, under the Romans' perspective, they look alike, Christians and Jewish. But now the Jews are saying, no way, we, we're different. We're not Christians. So the Jews began to harm Christians physically, driven them out of, of the towns, even turning Roman officials against them. Even worse yet, they managed to have families persecute Christians by their own families. I was encouraged. And under Roman law, the head of the household had absolute uh, authority over all its members. Unless the ruling male be, would become a Christian, the wife, the children, and the servants would have to be, if they were believers, they would have to accept whatever hardship would come from the house, uh, leader of the household. If they were sent away, they would have no place to turn to but to the church. So the church would have this incomplete families, either uh, uh, you know, a wife and servants without the husband or even a husband without a wife. And, you know, it was, it was crazy how the families were, were suffering as the persecution was splitting the families apart. Uh, if, the, you know, this is what's happening in, in, the, in the moment because the church, the Christians, were target for persecution. Now, Peter was writing especially for new converts, new Christians, and even for those who were just planning to be baptized or taking Bible studies. Peter wanted to warn them about what lay ahead. This letter is still helpful even today for Christians who are facing trials. Many Christians around the uh, world today are living under governments that even, are even more repressive than the Roman Empire was in the fir first century. As Christians then, uh, you know, uh, as they were uh, ridiculed and misunderstood and persecuted, many Christians today experience the same and even worse conditions. None of us is exempt from catastrophe or pain or illness, illnesses or even death. So trials that, like persecution, make us lean heavy on God's grace. Peter also, uh, also he was called Simon because he was the son of Simon, right? And he was also called Cephas. 
and uh, he was one of the 12 disciples chosen by Christ. Uh, together with his brother Andrew, who introduced uh, uh, you know, Peter to Jesus, and with James and John, formed the inner circle uh, that Jesus singled out for special training and fellowship. Uh, so Jesus started basically the church with these four individuals, Andrew, Peter, James and John. So this, this inner circle became his small group and then his church. Peter was one of the first to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, God's, uh, the Son of God. Now, although during uh, Jesus' trial, we have the picture and understanding that Peter denied Jesus, uh, you know, but he repented and became a great apostle. Now, notice this letter is addressed to God's elect strangers in the world, verse 1. Uh, so the first believers and leaders of the early church were Jews. That means that, you know, although they became Christians, they still were Jews. You know, that means they still worship on the Sabbath. They still, they still uh, attended their synagogue and things like that. So they were Jews, uh, you know, they were Jewish, uh, uh, accepted and kept their Jewish heritage uh, and traditions. Because of persecution, though, those believers had been scattered outside Jerusalem and throughout the empire, according to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. So persecution didn't stop the spread of the gospel. Instead, persecution served as a way to introduce the good news throughout the whole empire. Uh, so the gospel needed to keep moving forward. And uh, that's what was happening uh, during that time. Peter encouraged his readers by this strong declaration that they were chosen by God the Father. And that was a powerful statement that God the Father himself had chosen them, had called them out of, the, out of the world to become a church. At one time, the only nation uh, on the, the, uh, the, in this world that was part of, or could claim to be God's chosen people was Israel. But throughout Christ, all believers, Jews and Gentiles, belong to God. Praise God to that for that, right? Uh, our salvation and security uh, rest in God's merciful choice. No trials or persecutions can take away the eternal life God gives uh, to those who believe in him. Now notice how Peter mentions all three members of the Trinity in this first chapter. He talks about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All members of the Trinity or the Godhead uh, working together to bring salvation to all of us. The Father, uh, he identifies us, uh, giving him, uh, you know, the privilege of choosing us. Uh, like in Ephesians chapter 1, four, verse 4, it says. Uh, it also talks about the Son uh, who died for us while we were still sinners. Romans chapter 5, 6 to 10. And the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us. Romans 8, 26. And who sanctifies us for service. 2 Thessalonians two thirteen. So uh, here what he's talking about is the Trinity. And, and notice in this uh, slide here. Uh, we have, it says, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Son. That is, it has to do with the fact that there are three diff uh, individuals, three persons in the Godhead. And, uh, but they are all God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So uh, this is what Peter is emphasizing here. Now, how did God choose us? Uh, are we entitled to make our own choices if he's only making the choice that we are part of him? God alone originates and accomplishes our salvation. We cannot, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Uh, you know, but being chosen by God in no way removes the necessity for people to choose to follow. Uh, it's our decision to follow, but we are chosen by God for that. The fact that God knows all the events and decisions beforehand, even ordains them beforehand, does not mean that he enforces the actions of his creatures or leave them with no choice. Instead, God's foreknowledge means that he took the initiative and chose people, chose people before they had done anything to deserve it. So he provided a way, uh, you know, an option. Uh, all we need to do is pick up that option and, and just follow it. So God had intimate knowledge of these future believers. He, he knows, uh, you know, who would believe or not, and he knew them personally. Uh, those chosen ones were known by God the Father as a father who knows his children, except that God knew about them from eternity past. Now, God is not trapped in time. What he knows is from eternity past into eternity future. Uh, so believers are chosen, but not against their will. 
They're chosen because God is giving them a chance. Let's continue reading in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and following. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, soil or fade, kept in heaven for you. Verse 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little a while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Verse 7, these have come so that your faith or greater worth uh, than gold which perishes even through refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Verse 9, for you are receiving the goal of faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that God that was to come to you, search intently and with the great, uh, great care. Verse 11, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 12. Now the term new birth is introduced here and it's a, it's a reference to spiritual birth, regeneration. The Holy Spirit's act of bringing believers into God's family. This is what a new birth is. The term is a wonderful metaphor uh, of new life from God. You cannot be a Christian without a fresh beginning based on salvation that Christ brings. To be born again is a magnificent gift from God. So uh, we all have to go through that process. Now, do we need encouragement? Peter's words offer joy and hope in times of trouble, and he bases his confidence on what God has done for us through Christ. We are called into a living hope of eternal life, verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Our hope is not only for the future, but eternal life begins when we trust Christ and join God's family. Now, God will help us remain true to our faith through whatever difficult times we must face. Uh, when he talks about the last time, here he makes a reference to the judgment of the uh, day of Christ, which is described in Romans 14, verse uh, 10, and in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. You can study those chapters at home uh, so that you can have a background of the meaning last time. No matter what trials or persecution you may face, you cannot be harmed if you have had accepted Christ. Uh, you know, the, the gift of salvation that Christ has provided. So new birth is the key. We have to, all of us have to go through that process to be born again as a new creature in Christ. The Jews had looked to an inheritance in the promised land of Canaan, according to Numbers 32 and Deuteronomy chapter 2. Uh, although Israel had received that right of inheritance, see, it was their right. Eventually, because they defiled their faith through the influence of foreign nations, they lost that right as a nation uh, still is, is you know, uh, Israel, Israel is now, and Israelites then could uh, still be saved, uh, right, but not as a nation. Uh, the people's sin had caused the promise to become only a fading uh, memory. Christians now look forward to another inheritance, eternal life in the eternal city of God. And that has been, been given to us by the privilege of the gospel. God has reserved the, this inheritance and it will never fade away or decay. Now, why were these Christians the target of persecution when, uh, during Peter's time? Uh, number one, because they refused to worship the emperor, like I just mentioned before. Because they, worship, they refused to worship in pagan temples. Because they didn't support the Roman ideals of self-power and conquest. And because they exposed and rejected the horrible immorality of pagan culture. Uh, so Christians were looking for uh, another inheritance. You see, our inheritance is celestial, it's heavenly. We don't have anything here to inherit on this earth. Uh, what we inherit here is just temporary. But the inheritance that God is providing for us is eternal and it has to go 
to heaven. So trials and sufferings were common among believers. And, you know, this would uh, have to be accepted because what God was doing as gold is purified through fire, he was also purifying uh, people through trials and suffering. So uh, the same with us today. We often ask, why me, Lord? Why am I going through this? Uh, we should respond to suffering with a new set of responses. Rather than complaining, we should have confidence that God knows, plans, and directs our lives for the good. Secondly, that you know, uh, everything is for perseverance. When we face grief or anger or sorrow or pain, all of that is to strengthen us uh, spiritually. And also with courage, because with Jesus as brother as, and Savior, we do not need not to be afraid. Now, when Peter makes this statement, though you have not seen him, you love him, in verse 8, uh, he was making a reference to the occasion when uh, Thomas, the disciple, uh, you know, uh, had the unbelief that, that, you know, he hadn't seen Jesus. And he said, unless I see him and put my hand into his wounds, I will not believe. And then, you know, this is what he was making that reference. Now, he's talking about faith. Faith brings for, uh, forth salvation and the promise of a day when pain will end and perfect justice will begin. So faith will be rewarded and evil will be punished. But what should we do until then when that happened? Why, why should we uh, right, suffer? We have been chosen to faithfully serve God. How? By resolving conflicts, by mending the hurt, by working adult job, by confronting uh, problems, by rebuilding a marriage, by waiting for guidance. You see, God wants to use you so that other people will benefit. And that's why when we are faithful to, to the Lord, he can use us that way. So the spirit of Christ is another name for the Holy Spirit that uh, Paul, uh, Peter is emphasizing here in this first chapter. The Holy Spirit's mission is to guide mankind back to God. The Holy Spirit accomplishes such by teaching, helping, and guiding, according to John 4 and John 16. You see, ultimately, the imminent return of Christ should motivate us uh, to live for him. This means mentally, uh, to be mentally alert, to be discipled, and to be focused in Christ, our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Are we ready to meet Christ, living as God's obedient child? Are we ready to do that? In 1 Peter 1, 13 and following, we end up this first chapter I'm reading the following. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your whole, uh, hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ, Jesus Christ is revealed. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when, when you lived in ignorance. Verse 15. But as you, I'm sorry, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Verse 16. For it is written... Be holy because I am holy. Verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Verse 20, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in this last times for your sake. Verse 21, through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so your faith and hope are in God. Verse 22, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Verse 23, for you have been born again, not of perishable th seed, but of imperishable through the le living and enduring word of God. Verse 24, for all men are like grass and all their glories like the flowers of the field the grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of the lord stands forever first peter chapter 1 13 through 25 see god is holy he sets the standard for morality unlike the roman gods he's not word like he's not adulterous he's not pitiful you know he, this guy you know unlike those gods who are bloodthirsty jesus uh, uh, god is not like that He's a God of mercy and justice. He cares personally for each of his followers. You know, uh, our holy God expects us to uh, be intimate with him. 
uh, in the same way by following his high moral standards. Like him, we should be both merciful and just. Like him, we should sacrifice ourselves for others and bless others. When Peter tells us to be like our Heavenly Father, holy in everything we do, he's not stating that we should be sinless. Or, you know, although sinlessness is ideal. It's a good, that's the target. But you know, that will come later. But meanwhile, holiness, when he's saying to be holy, holiness means to be totally devoted and dedicated to God, set aside for a special use, set apart for, from sin and its influence. So that's what Peter is saying to us, that uh, you know, we should be holy, uh, we should be merciful, we should be just and righteous, just like our God is. We are to be set apart and different, not blending with the crowd. And yet, we're not to be indifferent to the needs of the crowd. We need to understand them. We need to mingle with them so that we understand their need and provide for them. What make us dif- makes us different are God's qualities in our lives. Our focus and priorities must be His then. We cannot become holy on our own. You know, the Holy Spirit's help is essential for our obedience to Him and to have power to overcome sin. So we have been set apart not to blend, Right, Not to imitate their actions, but to mingle, to help them out, and to make the difference in their lives. Uh, redemption is not an afterthought here. A slave was redeemed when someone paid uh, money to buy his, his or her freedom. God redeemed us from the tyranny of sin, not with money, but rather with the precious blood of his own son, uh, son Jesus, according to Romans 6.6. 6. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, and Colossians 2, 13 and 14. We cannot escape from sin or on our own. Uh, only the life of God's Son can uh, free us from sin. So Christ's sacrifice uh, here for our sins was not an afterthought because God did not decide uh, to do something when the world uh, spun out of control. God decided to do something even before the foundation of the world. Before the thought of creating the world, he already had provided uh, for you and I. So my life, your life is not an afterthought. My life and your life is, you know, I can say it began in the heart of God even before the creation of the world. That's, that is amazing. God's plan of salvation was set in motion by all the, all the all-knowing eternal God long before the foundation of the world. What a comfort Uh, is to hear, uh, and it must have been for the Jewish believers as well, to know that Christ was coming and that his work was planned even from before the world was created. That that was amazing. The assurance that that would bring to them the hope and peace. See, Christ's sincere love included selfless given and self-centered person. A self-centered person can naturally love like God does. God's love for his suffering church was a reality that freed, freed them from stress and from uh, uh, you know, pain. By sacrificing his life, Christ showed that his, you know, he truly loved you and I. In an interesting move, Peter quotes as he is ending this first chapter, he quotes Isaiah 40, and let us read it. Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. Voice says, cry out, and I said, why shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. Verse 7, the grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. Verse 8, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Uh, you know, why I say a 40? Peter was reminding believers that everything in this life, possessions, accomplishments, you know, pain, uh, happiness, joy, even the people ourselves will eventually fade away and disappear. Only God's will, only God's word, and only God's work will be permanent. We must stop grasping at the temporary and begin focusing our time, our money, and our effort on the permanent. The word of God is permanent and is our guide to eternity. And we should pay attention to the word of God. Peter was clearly stating that God's blessing for his church would come through the word of God and through his church. See, double a double weapon here, the word of God and the church. Peter, Peter concludes chapter 1 by saying, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that, that, that was preached to you. So he's 
reminding them that he preached this word to them. Therefore, since I preached this word to you, this eternal word to you, then don't worry when you are in the middle of struggles and, and you don't see a way out. Don't worry when you are accused, rejected, and even impeached. Yes, impeached. I will be your judge, he's saying. Don't worry when you are hungry, when you're homeless, when you're abandoned, literally on the street without any place to go to. The church can provide for you because the church is a spiritual house for you. You see, God provided the word and he provided the church. And this is amazing how God is combining these two. They put it in a tag team. So God's perfect plan, you know, God's plan is perfect, powerful, and it's transformational. The question is tonight, are you ready and willing today to accept God's perfect plan for your life? That's the, the, the request that I have for you. Are you willing to accept God's plan for your life? If you are, let me pray with you. Precious Father, we come before you once again. And we're so thankful that you provided salvation for us even before the foundation of the world. We're so thankful for your word because your word is powerful. Your word guides us. Your word changes us, rebukes us, transforms us. Thank you for the powerful word that uh, transformed our lives. We also thank you, O Lord, for the church, for one another. We ask that you may bless our church in a mighty way so that we may become that group, that body of Christ, that we represent you and bring the message of salvation, the good news of salvation to the whole community here. Bless us tonight, and thank you for listening to our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight in our first uh, se uh, sermon of this series uh, about the church, uh, and I hope that you will join us next week uh, for the same study. God bless you, and uh, enjoy a beautiful night. Bye-bye.